So we are going to read the True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, Chapter 14. Now remember, she has just gone up to the uh, top of the royal yard, um, basically the main mast in the middle of the ship. She got all the way to the top of it to prove to the crew that she could be one of them, and then she came back down, and so now she gets to the bottom, and she looks up, everybody's excited, huzzah, and then she realizes that Jaggery's there. Dun, dun, dun. So, we're going to pick up in chapter 14. Go and open up your books to chapter 14, and we will begin. There I stood. Behind me, the semicircle of the crew seemed to recoil from the man and from Mr. Hollybrass, who appeared not far behind. Miss Doyle, the captain said with barely suppressed fury, what is the meaning of this? I stood mute. How could I explain to him? Besides, there were no words left within me. I had gone through too many transformations of mood and spirit within the last 24 hours. When I remained silent, he demanded, Why are you dressed in this scandalous fashion? Answer me! The angrier it became, the darker grew the color of the welt on his face. Who gave you permission to climb into the rigging? I backed up a step and said, I, I have joined the crew. Unable to comprehend my words, Captain Jaggery remained staring fixedly at me. Then gradually he did understand. His face flushed red. His fists clenched. Miss Doyle, he said between gritted teeth, you will go to your cabin, remove those obscene garments, and put on your proper dress. You are causing a disruption. I will not allow it. But when I continued to stand there, unmoving, making no response, he suddenly shouted, Did you not hear me? Get to your cabin. Sounds kind of like a dad, like, go to your room, you're grounded. I won't, I blurted out. I'm no longer a passenger, I'm with them. So saying, I stepped back until I sensed the men around me. The captain glared at the crew. And you, he sneered, I suppose you'd have her? The response of the men was silence. The captain seemed unsure what to do. Mr. Hollybrass, he barked. Waiting your orders, sir. The captain flushed again. He shifted his attention back to me. Your father, Miss Doyle, he declared. He would not allow this. I think I know my father, an officer in the company who owns the ship, and your employer better than you, I said. He would approve of my reasons. So she's like, hey, yeah, um, I think I know my dad. By the way, your boss better than you do. The captain's uncertainty grew. At last he replied, very well, Miss Doyle. If you do not assume your proper attire this instant, if you insist upon playing these games, you shall not be given the opportunity to change your mind. If crew you are, crew you shall remain. I promise I shall drive you as I choose. I don't care what you do, I threw back at him. The captain turned to the first mate. Mr. Hollybrass, remove Miss Doyle's belongings from her cabin. Let her take her place in the forecastle with the crew. Put her down as Mr. Doyle. And let Miss Doyle in the log is lost. From this point on, I expect to see that he works with the rest so basically it's uh, another gender thing here he's saying oh yeah you're not a girl anymore then fine you're gonna be a boy we're gonna call you mr doyle and you're gonna live with the crew with that he disappeared into the steerage no sooner had he done so than the crew though not mr hollybrass let out another raucous cheer huzzah in just such a fashion did i become a full-fledged crew member of the seahawk Whatever grievous errors I had made before in thwarting the mutiny led by Cranach and in causing the resulting cruelty towards Zachariah, the sailors appeared to accept my change of heart and position without reservation. They saw my desire to become a crew member not only as atonement, but as a stinging rebuff to Captain Jaggery. Once I had showed myself willing to do what they did, by climbing the rigging, once they saw me stand up to Jaggery, an intense apprenticeship commenced, and for it the crewmen became my teachers. They helped me, worked with me, 
guided me past the mortal dangers that lurked in every task. In this, they were far more patient with all my repeated errors than those teachers at the Barrington School for Better Girls when there was nothing to learn but penmanship, spelling, and the ancient authors of morality. Now, I'm going to pause there for a minute. Your assignment with this chapter is going to be to write a diary entry, only this one, you can choose whose perspective it can come from. You could write it from Jaggery's perspective. You could write it from Holly Brass's perspective. You can write it from Charlotte's perspective. You can write it from um, any character you choose that is still alive. I don't want you to write it from Kranich or Zacharias. It'd be a little creepy. Writing from the bottom of the ocean. Um, but you can write it from any of the other crew members' perspectives um, and just kind of give their take on what's going on okay? and kind of describing the things that happen in this chapter. You may believe me, too, when I say that I shirked no work. Even if I'd wanted to, it was clear from the start that shirking would not be allowed, meaning like avoiding it. I pounded oakum into the deck. I scraped the hull. I stood watch as dawn blessed the sea and as the moon cut the midnight sky. I tossed the line to measure the depths of the sea. I took my turn at the wheel. I swabbed the deck and tarred the rigging, spliced ropes and tied knots. My mess was shared with the crew, and I went aloft. Indeed, that first journey to the top of the main mast was but the prelude to many daily climbs. Of course, after that first, there were always others who went along with me. High above the sea, my crewmates taught me to work with one hand. The other must hold on to dangle over spars, to reef sails, to edge along the walk ropes. So I came to work every sail at every hour of the day. As for the captain, he was as good as his word. No, better than his word. He continued to drive his crew without mercy. And since I was now a part of it, he drove them and me in particular harder than before. But try as he might, he could find no cause for complaint. I would not let him. So the crew is all on board. They all are like, yeah, Charlotte, you're one of us now. You're awesome. Um, we're going to protect you. We're going to help you. We're going to defend you. And so they, this whole time, they're, all they're doing is they're just um, showing her how to do all these things on the ship. Jaggery, on the other hand, is treating her just like every other crew member. And you've seen how he treats his crew. He's horrible to her, ordering her around, but she's not going to give up. She is one tough person. She is willing to do whatever it takes to prove to the crew that she's one of them. My knowledge of physical labor had been all but nil, of course. Hardly a wonder then that from the moment I joined the crew, I was in pain. I ached as if my body had been racked. My skin turned pink, then red then brown. The flesh upon my hands broke, first into oozing, running sores, then metamorphosed into a new rough hide. All is promised, and when my watch was done, I flung myself into my hammock and slept the sleep of righteousness, though never more than four hours and more often less. A word must be said about where and how I slept. It will be remembered that the captain denied me my cabin insisting that I take my place in the forecastle with the men. No doubt he thought to humiliate me and force me to return to my former place. The men caucused, which means they, they took a vote, that first day, and in a meeting that concluded with a sacred oath, bade me take my place along with them, swearing to give me the utmost privacy they could provide. They would be my brothers. I was no longer to be called Miss Doyle, but Charlotte. So now they're all on the same level. They're they're saying that they're her brothers. They're going to watch out for her. And so they're very accepting of her. Whereas she was awful to them. They're like, yeah, sure. You want to hang out with us? Awesome. Cool. I was given a hammock placed in a corner. Around this, a piece of torn sail was tacked up as a kind of curtain. The space was private for me and kept that way. True, I heard and learned their rough language. I confess, too, that in my newfound freedom, I brandished a few bold terms of my own to the amusement of the men at first, but after a while it became rather second nature to me and to them. I say this not to brag, but to suggest the complete absorption I felt in my new life. 
came to feel a sense of exhilaration in, in it, such as I had never felt before. So the cruise taught her some bad words. Thus it was that after a fortnight, I found myself atop the foremast, hugging the top gallant spar, my bare brown feet nimbly balancing on the foot ropes. It was seven bells of the second dog watch just before dusk. The wind was out of the northwest. Our sails were taut. Our studding sails were set. Below, the ship's bow, as though pulled by her winged figurehead, plunged repeatedly, stirring froth and foam. This rocking movement seemed effortless to me. Now, as if, like the ship's namesake, we were flying. Not far off our starboard bow, dolphins chased the waves, flyers themselves. My hair, uncombed for days, blew free in the salty air. My face, dark with weather, was creased with smile. I was squinting westward into the swollen face of a blood-red sun, which cast a shimmering gold road upon the sea. From where I perched, it seemed we were sailing on the road in a dream. And there I was, joyous, new-made, liberated from a prison I thought was my proper place. So she just, think about how she feels right now. How does it describe her feelings? I mean, she feels so happy and free, like she's been restricted and she's had all these rules. And now she can just, she's got the freedom to do whatever she wants. She lets her hair out. She doesn't have to worry about, you know, getting uh, all fixed up and fancy. And so she, she's she's happy. She didn't seem happy before, she, but she definitely seems happy now. The only shadow on my happiness was Captain Jaggery. He came on deck infrequently. And when he did, he was enveloped in the murkiest gloom. Rarely did he speak to anyone but the mates, Mr. Hollybrass and Mr. Johnson now, and only then to give orders or rebukes. Naturally, the captain was a principal subject of endless scuttlebutt in the forecastle during off-watch times. Scuttlebutt's like, just, they're, they're spreading rumors around him. Ewing claimed there was tension between the captain and the first mate because Mr. Hollybrass didn't approve of Jaggery's ways. Don't you believe it, said Keach, who, if anything, had grown more tense since his demotion. Holly Brass is gloved to Jaggery's hand. Meaning, Keach is saying that Holly Brass does whatever Jaggery tells him to do. Which, I think Holly Brass sounds like a nice dude. Fisk insisted Jaggery's keeping below us so much was only a case of his wanting to hide the welt on his face, of hiding himself in shame. It was Grimes who swore he was pressing us to make a crossing in a good time and so prove he'd done no wrong. But it was Foley who said that I was the cause of the captain's every move. What do you mean? I demanded. I've seen him, Foley insisted. Studied him. He doesn't come out unless it's your watch. One eye keeps the ship in trim, but the other... That's kind of creepy. He... Jaggery only comes out when Charlotte's there. What? I said, sensing already that he was right. He's always watching you, Foley said, looking around at the others for confirmation. And there's nothing but hatred in his eye. The others nodded in agreement. But why? I asked. He's waiting, wanting you to make a mistake, Morgan put in, taking a deep pull on his pipe then filling the forecastle with its acrid smoke. What kind of mistake, I asked. Something he can use against you. Something to set him right. Look here, Charlotte. You boxed him in. I did? It was that first moment you joined us. You mentioned your father, didn't you? Said he'd approve of what you've done. He would. He believes in justice. Be that as it may, Jagger didn't know what to do. He gave way. Not a thing he likes, you know. So now I say he's waiting for a mistake on your part to set himself back up. I don't intend to make a mistake, I stated proudly. Fisk spat on the floor. Neither does he. Came to pass, as Morgan promised. So they're saying Jagger is just waiting for Charlotte to mess up so he can yell at her. Or worse. To a person on land, the sight of a ship's sails, bleached by sun, stretched by wind, is the very image of airy lightness. In fact, a sail is made of very heavy canvas. When one gets tangled on a spar, it must be pulled loose quickly or it can tear or burst. 
and in so doing, pull down rigging, spars, even a mast. A sail out of control can flick like a wild whip and send a full-grown sailor into a senseless spin. It often happens. Now the flying jib is set at the furthest point of the bowsprit, the very tip of it. Remember the bowsprit is the point at the end of the at the front of the ship. When you consider that the bow of a speeding ship on a high sea forever rises and falls, you will perceive that a broken jib can dip into the sea itself. Such is the water's force and the driving of the ship. That the bowsprit itself can be caused to snap. Thus the sailor who seeks to repair a tangled jib must contend not only with a heavy flailing sail, but the powerful rushing sea only a few feet, sometimes closer below him. One afternoon, two days after our forecastle talk and during my watch, the flying jib became entangled in just the way I've described. As soon as he saw it, Captain Jaggery cried, Mr. Doyle, fix the bowsprit. In his haste to call on me, he spoke directly, not through one of his mates. Before I could respond, Grimes leaped forward, calling, I'll do it, sir. Grimes was one of the bearded ones, quick to flare, quick to forget. Meaning he's like, quick to get really mad, but he gets over it really quickly. The call was for Mr. Doyle, returned the captain. Does he refuse? No, sir, I said, and hurried to the night head, from which the bowsprit thrust forward. Grimes hurried along with me, offering hasty instructions in my ear, as well as urging a splicing knife upon me. I took it and put it in my pocket. Charlotte, do you see that line out there? He asked, pointing to the twisted line at the far end of the bowsprit that had snarled the jib. I nodded. Don't monkey with the sail itself. All you need to do is cut the rope. The sail will free itself, and we've got others. Mind you, you'll need to cut sharp. Then swing down under the bowsprit in one quick jump or the sail will toss you in. Understand? Again, I nodded. Time yourself proper. If the ship plunges, the sea will up grab you. So cocky had I become that I leaped to the head rail within, with little thought or worry, then set my foot upon the bowsprit itself. I saw that I needed to walk out along the bowsprit some 20 feet. Not too difficult a task, I thought, because the back rope was something I could cling to. So, if you've got the ship, this is my fancy drawing with a uh, keyboard. So if that's the bow sprit, wow, isn't that just lovely? Okay, and you got the, you got the Seahawk. Looks like, does not look like a bird. I mean, you just see it. <laughs> wow, this is awful. Okay, so there's the rope that she's trying to fix. There's Charlotte. I guess she wouldn't really be wearing a dress because she was wearing sailor's clothes. But you get the idea. She's got to go out here to the front of the ship and fix that as I have by now learned to do I started off by keeping my eyes on the bowsprit and my bare feet inching step by step along it the hiss of the water rushing below was pronounced the bowsprit itself wet and slippery with foam no matter, what took me by surprise was the bowsprit's wild bobbing. Halfway along, I glanced back. For the first time since I'd boarded the ship, I saw the figurehead clearly. The pale white seahawk with wings thrust back against the bow, its head extended forward, beak open wide in a scream. As the bow dipped, the open beak dropped and dropped again into the sea, coming up each time with foam streaming like a rabid dog. <sighs> So startled was I by the frightful vision that, for a moment, I froze until a sudden plunge of the ship almost tumbled me seaward. I reached the crucial point soon enough, but only by curling my toes tight upon the bowsprit and holding fast onto the back rope line with one hand was I able to free the other to take Grab's splicing knife from my pocket. I leaned forward and began to cut. 
The tightness of the tangled line helped. The knife cut freely. Too much so. The last remaining strands snapped with a crack. The sail boomed out, flicking away at my cutting hand, and the knife went flying into the sea. Even as I lunged for it, the bowsprit plunged. I slipped and started to fall, so her knife just flew into the ocean. My merest chance, I made a successful grab at the bowsprit itself, which left me hanging, feet dangling, only a few feet above the rushing sea. As the sea hawk plunged and plunged again, I was dunked to my waist, to my chest. Um, so she's at the front of the ship, and she could get pulled under. I tried to swing myself up to hook my feet over, but I could not. The sea kept snatching at me, trying to pull me down while I dangled there, kicking wildly, uselessly. Twice my head went under. Blinded, I swallowed water, choked. Then I saw that only by timing my leg swings to the upward thrust of the ship could I save myself. The ship heaved skyward. With all my might, I swung my legs up and wrapped them about the bowsprit. But again, the Seahawk plunged. Into the tearing sea I went, clutching the spar. Then up, this time I used the momentum to swing over. So I was now atop the bowsprit, straddling it, then laying on it. Someone must have called to the man at the helm. The ship shifted course, found easier water, slowed, ceased to plunge so. Gasping for breath, spitting seawater, I was able to pull myself along the bowsprit and finally, by stepping on the wooden bird's furious head, climbed over the rail. Grimes was there to help me onto the deck and give me an enthusiastic hug of approval. The captain, of course, watched me, stony-faced. Mr. Doyle, he barked, come here. Though greatly shaken, I had no time to be frightened. I had done the task and knew I'd done it. I hurried to the quarterdeck. When I ask you to do a job, the captain said, it's you I ask and not another. You've caused us to change course, to lose time. And before I could respond, he struck me across the face with the back of his hand, then turned and walked away. He just smacked her. My reaction was quick. Coward! I screamed at him. Fraud! Whoa! He spun about and began to stride back toward me, his scarred face contorted in rage. But I, in a rage myself, wouldn't give way. I can't wait till Providence, I shouted at him. I'll go right to the courts. You won't be Captain Long. You'll be seen by everyone as a cool, cruel despot that you are. And I spat upon the deck by his boots. My words made him turn as pale as a ghost. A ghost? with murder in his eyes. It's not the way you want someone looking at you. But then abruptly he gained control of himself and, as he'd done on previous occasions, whirled about and left the deck. I turned away, feeling triumphant. Much of the crew had seen it all, but there were no more hurrahs. The moment passed. Nothing more was said, save by Grimes, who insisted that I take lessons in the handling of a knife, carrying it, using it, even throwing it. My first watch off, he had me practice on the deck for three hours. Two more days passed without incident. In that time, however, the sky turned a perpetual gray. The air thickened with moisture. Winds rose and fell in what I thought was a peculiar pattern. Toward the end of the second day, when Barlow and I were scraping down the capstan, I saw a branch on the waves. A red bird was perched on the branch. Look, I cried with delight, pointing to the bird. Does that mean we're close to land? Barlow hauled himself up to take a look. He shook his head. That bird's from the Caribbean. One thousand miles off. I've seen them there. Blood bird, they call them. What's it doing here? After a moment, he said, storm driven. I looked at him in surprise. What kind of storm would blow a bird that far? I asked, wide-eyed. Hurricane. What's a hurricane? The worst storm of all. Can't we sail around? Barlow again glanced at the helm, the sails, and then at the sky above. He frowned. I had heard Mr. Hollybrass and Jaggery argue about it. To my understanding, he said, I don't think the captain wants to avoid it. Why not? It's what Grimes has been saying. The captain's trying to move fast. If he sets us right at the hurricane's edge, it'll blow us home like a pound of shot and a two-pound cannon. What if he doesn't get it right? Two pounds of shot in a one pound can. So again, you get to see one of my lovely drawings.
So if this is a hurricane, okay, what Jagger is trying to do is hit the edge of the hurricane, okay? If he hits the edge of it, this spinning will spin. The, the spinning air will spin and fling them forward, and they'll go really fast, okay? However, if he times it wrong, and instead they fly right into the middle of the hurricane, it's not going to end well. You get the idea. So that's the end of the chapter. What I need for you to do, remember, you are writing a journal from a character's perspective. I don't care which character. It can be Jaggery. It can be – you could do Charlotte. You could do uh, – Grimes was mentioned in this chapter. Fisk. I think Barlow was in there once. Holly Brass is in there. Um, so any one of those characters, choose one of them and write a journal telling me what happens in this chapter. That's it. Um, until next time, be awesome.